thank you very much to Kaki for inviting me here and good evening everyone. Um, I'd also like to thank Bharat, for, uh, Diksha and Kaiwan and of course Farooq for this whole idea about doing a talk about the Dutch in India. I'd also like to thank uh, my friend Priya Mehta who has helped me with the pronunciations of the Dutch words and if I am mangling a pronunciation the reflection is not upon her. Okay. So let us start with understanding how the Dutch got here. Very much like our other Europeans, um, what were the Dutch doing here in India? So, so the arrival of the Europeans to the shores of our subcontinent is causally linked to a time known as the Age of Discovery in Europe. A combination of circumstances led to men seeking new routes across the seas from the mid 15th to the mid 16th centuries. They were not looking for new lands, but the hunt for the new routes led to the discovery of many new lands. The reason for this hunt for new routes can be attributed to various reasons. With the breakup of the Mongol Empire towards the end of the 14th century, safe passage over the overland route, that which we often call the Silk Route, was no longer guaranteed for Western merchants. Secondly, the Ottoman Turks and the Venetians controlled commercial access to the Mediterranean as well as the old sea routes from the east. Countries along the Atlantic coast of Europe were losing out on the trade as well as paying exorbitant amounts to buy those goods. So these countries now began to look for other routes to ensure a part of the world trade for themselves. The route to the east was discovered by the Portuguese. It was a race for spices that led the Portuguese to invest their time and money in finding their way to India and further east. Pepper was king and everybody wanted a piece of that trade, but the Portuguese managed to hold on to it till the end of the 16th century. In the latter half of the 16th century, England, Holland and France, all growing commercial and naval powers, waged a fierce struggle against the Spanish and Portuguese monopoly of world trade. In 1580, the Portuguese royal family died out in the direct line and Philip II of Spain took over the Portuguese throne. This upheaval led to the fall in the supply of pepper to Lisbon and other European countries began to move in. English privateers and Dutch traders quickly began to fund expeditions to India and further east. The Dutch were able to use the navigational knowledge of the geographer Planicus and of Dutch seafarers who had traveled to the east in the service of the Portuguese. However, they did try to find better routes to get to the Indies, believing that if they could, they could sail northwards and find a quicker and safer route, less enemy ships along the route to the Indies. Three, um, state funded voyages were to be launched in order to find this northern route. However, when the first two returned after a futile search for some such passage, further expeditions at state expense were abandoned. The Dutch state promised significant rewards to anyone who managed to find the northern route, but it was not to be. So the first successful trip, if you could call it that, took place in 1595 when the first Dutch fleet from the Company of Fair in Amsterdam set off from Texel, this island over here in Northern Holland. Three well-equipped ships accompanied by a smaller, heavily armed pinnace followed the route taken from a description by Jan Hayekum van Linshouten who had actually made this journey earlier on Portuguese ships. He had actually served with a Portuguese archbishop. They had a very tough journey with many conflicts along the way and many lives were lost. They finally reached Bantam. Bantam is right down here on Java, Sorry. right here on the island of Java in Indonesia today. It used to be the most important on the island of Java for the spice trade. They reached here in 1596, but three, only three out of the four ships managed to reach 
back to the Netherlands in 1597 with only 87 survivors of the original crew of 240. So the voyage itself was a commercial failure, but nonetheless, it had proved that it was possible to sail to Asia. So this became the first of many voyages to the East. The goal was not India, but rather this group of islands here, the Moluccas, the Spice Islands. Small individual merchant companies put together fleets of four to five ships and they sailed out of Rotterdam and Amsterdam for the Indies. But the competition between all these companies was not helping anybody. It pushed the prices down and the expeditions were already very, very expensive. On top of that, the traders also had to be protected by the Dutch Navy from the Portuguese, so they had to pay the Dutch state. So that took away further profits. So the Dutch merchants finally came together and after very, very difficult negotiations among the various companies, decided to set up a single joint company the Dutch East India Company, also often called the United East India Company or the Verenigte Oost Indisch Company. It was established on the 20th of March, 1602, and they were given the monopoly for all Dutch trade and shipping in Asia. Building up a trade network far overseas in a time of war with Spain and Portugal required a huge sum of money. They put in an investment at that time of close to six and a half million Dutch guilders as their share capital. This was put up by shareholders who would then receive a dividend from the profits of the return shipments. Anybody could invest. The shareholders came from all walks of life. You had daily wage workers, you had preachers, doctors, big merchants. And we can see this in the amounts invested because they vary from 50 guilders to 85,000 guilders. The VOC, as it was called, was granted a patent by the Dutch States General, their parliament. Apart from granting them a monopoly in trade, it also granted them the right to build forts, wage wars, and conclude treaties in the name of the States General. In addition to the trading, the company also had to help in the war against Spain and Portugal by bringing in more money. The war fleet would in turn help defend trading positions in the east. And the English competition was also allowed to sail close to the Moluccas in the hope of harassing the Portuguese. The VOC itself was a very large organization. It was divided into several chambers. Amsterdam, Zeeland, Delft, Rotterdam, Hoom, and Inkhausen. Each of the chambers had their own directors, their own shipyards, their own warehouses. This is a drawing of the shipyard in Amsterdam. Altogether, there were 60 directors. The directors of the old company became directors in the new company. And these directors were no longer jointly or individually liable for the debts of the company. The governance of the company in the Indies was highly centralized. The highest authority rested with a governor general and the council of the Indies, also very grandly called the High Indies Council or the High Indies Government. And it sat at Batavia, which is close to Bantam on Java. The area corresponds more or less with modern day Jakarta today. And the members of the Council of the Indies came from the administrative setups in the outer regions. So the governor general and the council were naturally supposed to be subordinate to the government in the Netherlands. But being so far away from the Netherlands, they tended to act rather independently, waging wars and signing treaties with local rulers. The VOC, sorry, this is, I just wanted to show you Dutch Batavia in 1681. And this is a beautiful painting of what Batavia would have looked like at the time. This is the VOC's dozens of trading posts or factories within this massive trade network that stretched across Asia and Africa. All these factories or lodges, um, the French and the Dutch call them lodges, the British call them factories, came under the authority of the high government from Batavia. <laughs> 
most of the settlements were small. They were small offices, small trading settlements. Most did not even own their own land. You had between a dozen uh, VOC servants to sometimes several hundred VOC servants working in different establishments. In Java, they definitely acquired their own land, as well as in the Moluccas and in Ceylon, which was also very important. So Batavia became the seat of the government of the High Indies Council. So it became the focal point, the central point of the entire trade network in Asia. More than 20,000 people worked on the, in the VOC in Asia in the mid 18th century alone. More than half of them were soldiers. The men on the ships made up another 25%, while the merchants and the administrative cadre made up the rest. This concentration around Southeast Asia required control of the Eastern Seas, and for this, the Dutch had to eliminate their main European rivals, the Portuguese. They defeated them and ousted them from Southeast Asia, but the Portuguese managed to hang on to Goa and other small settlements in India. The next big obstacle for the Dutch were the English, who had followed them to the East Indies. However, the English East India Company was no match for the Dutch at this time, and they were sent packing from the East Indies in 1623. The Dutch objective was not religion or empire, but trade. In particular, the spice trade. They wanted a monopoly in the spice trade, and it was this that later led to imperialism. And it was for this reason that they went directly to the East Indies, which were the main source of spices. India was of secondary importance for its pepper, cardamom, and textiles. The Dutch, like the British, were short of exchange goods. You needed silver to buy the spices. And if you wanted to avoid dipping into the scarce European resources, you needed some other commodity to exchange for the spices. Textiles from India, silks and cottons could be used to buy the spices, but silver was required for that also. So in order to retain the spice monopoly, the Dutch developed this elaborate trade system that spread from the Persian Gulf to Japan. And its only objective was to get goods that they could use to exchange for spices without having to use any of their European resources. So it was this trade that brought the Dutch to the Coromandel coast, to Surat and Bengal in India. Dutch sea power, which was much more efficient than the Portuguese, secured them a monopoly on the islands and the sea lanes. But the story was very different in land areas where they would start facing stiff competition, particularly from the British. So this is showing you this, of course, is all European settlements here in India. And you're going to see that it's going to be the Portuguese who will then give up to the Dutch, who will then have to give up to the British. So on the seas, you might have been more powerful, but on the land, it's the English East India Company who's going to land up becoming the victor at the end of it all. Dutch presence in India lasted for over 200 years, between 1605 and 1825. The Dutch East India Company first established themselves on the Coromandel Coast. Then they established themselves in Surat and Bengal by 1627, and then took the Portuguese forts on the Malabar after they took Ceylon from the Portuguese. They divided up their establishment in India into two governates, Dutch Ceylon and Dutch Coromandel, one commandment that was Dutch Malabar, and two smaller directorates, Dutch Bengal and Dutch Surat. Surat was already a very important international trading port under the Mughal Empire, and it was the first Indian city to be visited by Dutch merchants as early as 1602. However, the two unfortunate merchants who went to Surat were moving further out of Surat to move towards the Mughal Emperor in Agra. Hardly have they left the city when the Portuguese intercepted them and executed them. In 1607, another Dutch merchant made it to Surat, but apparently he was harassed to such an extent by the Portuguese that it is believed that he committed suicide. So not exactly a very auspicious beginning. 
So if we go now to Dutch Coromandel, the Dutch settled on the Coromandel coast in 1605 and set up a small establishment at Masulipatnam. This is a lovely view of Masulipatnam in 1676. And we have another slight similar one in this lovely black and white drawing. Their lodge at Masulipatnam continued operating until 1756 when the Dutch left Masulipatnam for good. In the meantime, apparently the lodge at Masulipatnam faced tremendous problems. It had been through three major fires in the town, a cyclone and a tsunami. The Dutch then set up a small establishment at the village of Petapolis, which is now called Nizam Patnam in 1606, because the village was very famous for its linen textiles. But the factory was not very successful and it was abandoned by 1668. The Dutch were determined to have a very strong presence on the Coromandel and traded here for cotton textiles, including linen for shrouds. You'll find this when you're looking at what the Dutch were trading in, that from the Coromandel, a large amount of shrouds were actually being exported. Rice, salt, saltpeter for gunpowder, and indigo were the other important goods. So the Dutch began to build a fort at Devanampatnam after permission was granted by the Nayakas of Jinji. Construction started in 1608, but under pressure from the Portuguese, the Nayakas took the fort back from the Dutch. The area was buzzing with trade. Sandalwood, camphor, cloves, nutmeg, mace, velvets, porcelains, copper and brass all sailed out on ships from this port. When the area came under the Marathas, Shivaji's son Rajaram auctioned the fort to the highest European bidder in 1690. The British won by outbidding the Dutch and the French. The governor of Madras acquired it and renamed it Fort St. David. You can actually see a little Dutch flag over here within the British flag over here. Uh, Robert Clive actually served as governor of this fort in 1756. So the Dutch still had their small lodge and warehouse at nearby Kudalore, but now they had to pay taxes on the merchandise to the English. So they finally decided to abandon the factory and the lodge, which had actually only served to keep an eye on the English. And they moved their factory to a place called Porto Novo, Paranjipetai, as it is called today. There they built a new warehouse and they set up an indigo dyeing factory. However, the presence of the English in still close by Fort St. David led to the decision to quit this lodge as well. Two Dutchmen were apparently kept there to stay there and obtain or purchase cotton textiles, which were desperately required for trading uh, in return for spices in the Moluccas. From 16. 10 to 1687, Pulikat became the main settlement for the Dutch on the Coromandel and the seat of the governor of the Coromandel coast. Pulikat was a very important settlement as there was a very high demand in the Moluccas for the cotton fabrics that were produced here. The cotton fabrics would then be traded for the spices there. So in 1613, the Dutch were given permission by a lo the local rulers to build a fort. And it was to have been jointly built by the Dutch and the local queen, uh, the queen who was Eraivi, who was the queen of the uh, king of Vijayanagar, King Venkata II. But somehow that doesn't seem to have worked out and the Dutch finished the very famous Fort Geldria all alone. It was built on the shores of Lake Polikat, ostensibly on the foundations of an old Portuguese fort. And the fort became a, local, a focal point in local skirmishes, often providing shelter to people from nearby uh, Portuguese colonies. In 1615, the first VOC mint in India was established at Fort Geldria, where initially their caste copper coins with the VOC monogram and a Sanskrit legend were minted. The Pulikat mint operated till 1674 when a new mint was established at Nagapatnam. These coins were widely used in Ceylon. 
Pulikat remained a very important trading post until the second half of the 17th century when it began to decline due to the growing competition from the British. By 1689, the Dutch government had moved to Nagapatanam and then on to Ceylon. The fort was left with just a handful of men and guns. It was finally surrendered to the British in 1795, but before that, they, the Dutch blew up their own fort. These are some more drawings of the fort, a very, very beautiful trace Italian style fort that you find. I'll show you what is left of it today. In 1612, the Dutch had set up a small establishment at Sadras, Sadrangapatanam. However, Sadras became a very important trading post as the quality of cotton textiles here was extremely fine and they hand painted it very, very beautifully. Apart from the textiles, they also got stone for construction, which was sent all the way to Batavia and to Ceylon to construct houses. By 1749, the Dutch built a large fortified compound here. You can actually see the fort outlined quite clearly. Um, like many other settlements, Sadras also passed into the hands of the French, was taken by the English, then returned to the Dutch, was raided by the English again in 1818 and came under the East India Company. Palikol, today Palakolu, had a small lodge set up in 1613 and the VOC built an indigo dyeing factory here for cotton textiles. A bleaching factory was also built as well as a ropeway for manufacturing ropes for the shipping, they built a carpentry yard, a forge, and a warehouse over here. However, Palikol had the same fate. It was taken by the English in 1781, who blew up many of the buildings, but handed it back to the Dutch after the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War of 1780-84, only to take it permanently back by 1825. Golconda today's Hyderabad, was another very important trading post for the Dutch. They maintained a permanent native VOC staff here from 1634. They bought cotton blankets, chintz, which is printed cotton fabric, carpets, leather, iron, and diamonds in return for spices, ivory, tea, and coffee. However, in 1693, they were officially prohibited from trading there, so their participation in trade here ended. Bhimli Patnam, today's Bhimuni Patnam, was the site of a Dutch lodge from 1652. It was converted into a small fortress. You can just about see the drawing of the fortress. Again, a small trace Italian fort. Not really a very important center for trade, Bhimuni Patnam was very important for them because the area grew a lot of rice. And this rice was required by the Dutch for trading with Ceylon. This is the fort. You can just about see its edges over here in this picture on Google Earth. In 1658, the Dutch captured the town and fortress of Nagapatnam from the Portuguese, but they subsequently lost it to the local Nayaka ruler. However, it was taken back by the Dutch and came under the VOC governorate of Ceylon. Legend has it that a huge tidal wave destroyed the walls and most of the town, and the Dutch used the rubble to build their new fort, Fife Sinin. This was a very beautiful star fort, which became the seat of the governor when they moved their headquarters from Polika to Nagapatanam in 1690. The five bastions were actually named after the five senses of hearing, sight, taste, smell, and sense. Pondicherry, which everyone believes only was the French, was actually bought from the Mughal emperor by the Dutch at the cost of 50,000 pagodas. This is a gold pagoda. Um, it was a gold currency minted by local rulers, as well as by the British and the Dutch and the French. The Dutch minted their gold pagodas at Tutikoran and Colombo in Ceylon. So in 1693, the VOC governor of the Coromandel finally managed to take it from the French. Their personnel were all sent back to France. And the Dutch built a huge ring wall around the city, as well as other small strongholds. So this is the wall that they built around. This is the original fort, secondary walls here, bigger walls around, and they built smaller outposts 
seven of them around the city itself. Um, the Dutch high government in Batavia thought this was a complete and utter waste of money. And it actually turns out that they were correct because the war between France and the Netherlands in Europe ended in 1697. And by the peace treaty that was signed, Pondicherry had to be returned to the French. The French did agree to pay 16,000 pagodas to the Dutch for all the fortifications that they had constructed. A large Dutch warehouse to store textiles from the North Coromandel before they were sent off to the East Indies was set up at a place called Jagaranayak Punap. Today it's called Kakinada in Andhra. And this was set up in 1734. It became one of the most important VOC settlements on the Coromandel coast. Surrendered again very often to the British to the English only to be returned to the Dutch because of events in Europe. In 1881, it was finally handed over to the British. In Dutch Bengal, the first Dutch ships of the VOC arrived in 1615, but their permanent settlement at Pipli only came up at 1627. Pipli is today's Baliapal because there was tremendous political unrest in the area. The Dutch were very interested in trading for cotton and silk textiles, opium and saltpeter from Bengal. And they tried very, very hard to get a monopoly in the trade of saltpeter. Dutch ships used to make a biannual journey to Bengal. They would leave Bengal at the beginning of what's called the northern monsoon, somewhere around 10 to 15 September, from where they would sail down the Bay of Bengal to Gale in uh, Ceylon, where they would take on cinnamon, and from there they would sail to Batavia. They would come back a second time in April. A big problem that the Dutch had here was the fact that their big ships didn't do very well in the fast moving waters of the Ganga and its tributaries. And apparently the VOC lost 12 large ships in the river and at the mouth of the river. And so then they realized, learned their lesson and began sending smaller ships to Bengal. The Dutch decided to build their settlement at Pipli because saltpeter was purified here. However, by the middle of the 17th century, Patna and Siopra or Chapra became the main centers for saltpeter. The settlement at Pipli turned out to be not so very um, favorable because of very frequent flooding and many, many sandbanks. So they thought they might run it as a transshipment port, but by 1670, the port of Pipli was so badly silted that it was abandoned and Hooghly became the chief settlement for the Dutch in Bengal. Hooghly had been a Portuguese settlement till 1632. The Dutch set up a trading post here and gave it the name Hooghly after the river Hooghly in the Gangetic Delta. To begin with, it came under the jurisdiction of Dutch Coromandel, but the trading post became more and more important and it got its own management. In 1656, the lodge at Hooghly was washed away in a storm surge, and so they decided to set up a new settlement at nearby Chinsura but it was still officially called Hooghly, which is why it's called Hooghly Chuchura in this uh, picture. Uh, Chuchura is the name for Chinsura today. Hooghly was considered to be so important that it became the third port with a direct connection to the Netherlands after Batavia and Ceylon. The VOC considered cargo from Bengal so very valuable and for ships to sail from Bengal to Batavia and then to the Netherlands meant that they would arrive in Europe at the very dangerous sailing season of autumn, which they were unwilling to risk the cargoes for. So they would actually sail directly from Bengal to the Netherlands, bypassing Ceylon and Batavia. The Dutch, so just to show you a few more pictures of Chinsura. This is the saltpeter factory at Chapra. So the Dutch set up settlements in Patna, Chapra, Balesur, which is today's Baleshwar, Dhaka, and Kasim Bazar. Of these, Patna and Baleshwar only had a lodge and a warehouse, but Chapra had a large saltpeter factory. The saltpeter extracted here was sent directly to the Netherlands. The settlement in Dhaka itself was very small. It was just established because it was the seat of the Nawabs and it was easier and rather useful for getting permits permissions, permits, farmans from the Nawab. 
Qasim Bazar, which lay 250 kilometers from Hooghly, was the center for silk production. And by 1715, the VOC employed about 4,000 local silk winders over here. On the northwestern coast, Dutch Surat, and this is the spelling they use, that's why I have continued with it, the VOC set up a flourishing trade network with a number of smaller establishments in the hinterland. So Agra and Burhanpur are not on this map, but that's why it's marked as they're further in the hinterland. Surat became the head of the directorate with a direct at the helm and played a very important role until 1759. This is a beautiful drawing of what the Dutch lodge at Surat would have looked like in the early 1600s. Surat stayed an important post until 1759. Trading posts were set up at Kambe on the Gulf and at Barhanpur, Jabalpur and Kursat. So this is the lodge at Agra. What happened to Surat? By the first half of the 18th century, there were problems for the Dutch at Surat as it gradually began to be cut off from the interior. So this created a problem in the supply of cotton and indigo coming from Agra and its surrounding areas. Trade on the Red Sea also was being severely hampered by pirates as well as tremendous extortion by local rulers. So so finally, after a lot of strife and almost impoverishment, the Dutch left Surat to the East India Company in 1759. Agra was extremely important for the European traders, not just because it was the capital of the Mughal Empire, but for the fact that the best quality indigo came from the areas around it. So the VOC set up a lodge, and this is their lodge in Agra, in 1621, about half a mile away from the river Yamuna. They built a large building where they would bleach the fabrics and dye the cotton right next to the lodge. Besides the indigo, the markets in Agra also offered silks and cottons from Bengal. Agra was six weeks away from Surat, traveling by road. And because of this, inspectors from the VOC from Batavia very rarely came to visit this warehouse. This unfortunately allowed the VOC servants in Agra to make absolute fortunes in private trade. It was generally held that if somebody did not return very rich from a posting in Agra, he had not really been doing his job properly. Another important trading city in the Northwest was Ahmedabad. The markets here traded in indigo, cotton and silk fabrics, diamonds and saltpeter. You didn't pay import or export duties in Ahmedabad, rather you had to give gifts to the local governor. The VOC established a settlement here in 1617. However, with the decline of the Mughal Empire in the early 18th century, trade declined and the road between Ahmedabad and Surat became very dangerous. And so the branch of the VOC at Ahmedabad was shut down in 1744. Dutch Malabar. The Dutch Malabar had many settlements and lodges, and most of these were taken from the Portuguese by force. Vengurla was the only one north of Goa. Um, the others all lay south of Goa. And they built a lodge in Vengurla here in 1637, mainly to keep an eye on the Portuguese. The VOC did try to take Goa from the Portuguese, but despite several attempts, were unable to conquer it. The VOC initially only traded in pepper on the Malabar coast. They opened their first office here after signing the treaty with a local prince of Kanyakulam. After they had defeated the Portuguese in Ceylon and expelled them from there, they wanted to ensure that the Portuguese would not continue to threaten them from the Malabar coast. So this became one of the main reasons for settling here. However, of course, the trade in pepper was also a very strong motivation. Quilon or Koilan was made in the chief settlement on the Malabar after it was captured from the Portuguese. This is the fortress at Koilan. And you'll see most of these maps of the fortresses are actually the Portuguese maps because these were originally Portuguese forts then taken over by the Dutch. This was followed by Kraganor, which lay north of Cochin in 1662. This is Kraganor. And then Cochin, modern day Kochi itself was besieged. 
after a three months long siege, the Portuguese handed over Cochin in January of 1663. And the Portuguese fort of Kanur, this is Fort Emmanuel at Kochi, and this is the fort at Kanur, was taken a month later. And in March 1663, the Dutch signed a treaty with the local Kolathiri chief and took over this entire area. Ironically, the Portuguese and the Dutch had signed a treaty, the Treaty of Hague, ending hostilities in Europe by August of 1661, two years before this is happening. But news had not reached this part of the world until the Portuguese had been expelled from the Malabar coast. The Dutch governor of Ceylon wanted to establish a monopoly on the pepper trade in on the Malabar and the fort and harbor at Cochin, he felt, would be a very good center for shipbuilding and ship repair. The Malabar, excuse me, was originally under the commandment of Ceylon, but became an independent commandment in 1699. Cochin began, became its seat of government and new fortifications were built again at Quilon, Kanor and Kraganor. However, the VOC found it very difficult. They could not get the monopoly on the pepper trade. The contracts they would sign with the local princes proved to be extremely difficult to enforce. The pepper, instead of being sold directly to them, was being smuggled out by Arab traders and then sold to the English East India Company. To add to that, the very powerful state of Travancore was on the rise south of Cochin, somewhere around 1730, which meant there was yet another player in the game. The VOC tried to prevent their entrance into the pepper trade by carrying out military action, but they lost the Battle of Kolkachal in 1741. The pepper trade was further threatened by the Kingdom of Mysore towards the north. After 1770, the VOC sold off all the lesser profit-making settlements, including Kraganor, to local princes. And when a big harbor was built in Travancore in 1781, the Asian pepper traders completely bypassed the VOC settlements. Finally, the high government in Batavia decided that profits were too low to keep the settlements on the Malabar. Only Cochin was still held, and this too was taken over by the East India Company in 1795 on the basis of the very famous Q letters. So what about our Bombay? Because after all, we need to discuss what happened with Bombay and the Dutch. Not very much, but there was an impact. When the governor Humphrey Cook came to Bombay, he wanted to improve on the fortifications of the old manor house of Garcia da Orta. However, the English East India Company's council in Surat refused to give any money, saying that if the king had wanted to fortify the manor house, he would have sent money from England. However, war breaking out with the Dutch in Europe led to finally the uh, English beginning fortifications here sorry, war between the Dutch and the English breaking out in Europe led to the beginnings of fortifications here for Bombay in 1665. And these fortifications, which we call our Bombay Castle, this little thing, this is of course a map of the much larger fort, which will come later in 1715. This is the Bombay Castle that was built. It did manage to withstand a Dutch attack in February of 1673, when Rikloffer van Hoon, the governor general of Dutch India attacked Bombay that time under Governor Gerald Anger. The Dutch apparently found themselves facing quite a large amount of fire in the form of 100 cannon on the fort and other 80 pieces at other convenient strands. The Treaty of Westminster, signed in 1674 between England and the Netherlands, ended the hostilities and relieved the English of any kind of further attacks on Bombay. So the VOC itself, can be called one of the most successful companies of all time. It raised enough capital in 1602 to create a globe straddling multinational conglomerate that employed 70,000 people at its peak. In its 200 year run, it sent over 1 million voyagers to Asia. According to Alex Payne, who has done research on the history of very large trading companies, in the year 1637, the VOC had its boom 
sort of combined with the very famous tulip mania, the worth of the VOC was estimated at 78 million Dutch guilders, which if you take adjusting for inflation translates to somewhere around 7.9 trillion dollars in modern terms, modern dollars. And as Peter Fiss, the writer puts it, if the market capitalization of 20 of the world's largest companies were added together, it would come up to 7.9 trillion. So what happened to this big company? Unfortunately for the VOC, the 18th century wasn't so great. And in the last quarter of the 18th century, things just went from bad to worse. This big company became just too large and too slow. Their profit margins also began to be reduced as they began to trade in more and more products like coffee and tea and textiles for which there was very fierce competition. So the profit margins have come down. Intra-Asian trade also declined after 1760. The costs of keeping the company kept on increasing. You needed more and more soldiers, more patrols, because the English were becoming stronger and stronger. There were more local skirmishes, more wars, particularly in Indonesia and Java, which also cost a lot of money. Another thing that hurt it tremendously was private trade. Private trade by VOC servants was actually prohibited. However, it was continued on the side. And it grew to such an extent that it actually undercut their own profits. It was hurting the company financially. And then, of course, the last blow was the fourth Anglo-Dutch war in Europe. It caused great damage to the Dutch economy. And the English fleet actually stopped all Dutch shipping traffic between the Netherlands and Asia. So as a result, no products came from Asia to the Netherlands. That went up very, very sharply. No money transports came back to Asia to purchase goods. And everything sat stagnating in warehouses here. So by the end of the 18th century, most of the Dutch colonies had been taken over by Britain because of politics in Europe. One more thing that we need to discuss when we talk about the Dutch in India and in the East Indies is slavery the human cargoes that they carried. Recently, there has been a lot of research being done on v about the human cargo that was carried on VOC ships. And it is emerging that the Dutch transported tens of thousands of men, women, and children from Bengal, from the Coromandel, from the Malabar, to work in plantations on Southeast Asia, Mauritius, and Reunion as indentured labor. You could buy slaves at Polikat. This is, in fact, slaves being sold at Pipli or Baliapal. You could buy slaves at Polikat from a, for anywhere between four guilders to 40 guilders. So the trade in slaves continued despite the ban by the governor of Madras, the British governor of Madras. But it was only in the late 18th century that the slave trade was finally phased out. It's not very fair to say that only the Dutch did this. Um, local pirates, and there were many in the uh, Bay of Bengal, the Portuguese, the French, and English vessels also carried out um, a lot of slavery. What they would do is that they would send out these forays into the countryside and they would capture men and women. And these slaves would then be sold off at various uh, ports. They would be sold at, as domestic servants, as cooks, as barbers, entertainers, coach drivers. And there was a particularly large demand for slaves from Africa on the entire east coast of India. Um, there's some very fantastic articles on scroll. In fact, if you can, you could read a wonderful article by Tathagatan Yogi, who talks about the slave trade being carried out in Calcutta, or uh, Calcutta's dark past. So what have we got left of the Dutch presence in India today? Hardly anything. The forts, the lodges are broken down. The closest one to Bombay is at Vengurla. Um, the local people there call it the Dacha Nachi Vakar. So they know this is a Dutch factory. The building is in such shambles that that's a board prevent saying, please do not go in because it is exceedingly dangerous. Though people do go in, as you can see from that scooter. This is Vengurla. This is Fort St. Angelo at Kanur. It has been restored. It is not in as bad a shape, but this is the original Portuguese fort, which then went to the Dutch and then went to the British. 
Kraganor is in fact in a mess. This is all that you have left of Kraganor Fort. And if you see this, um, when the, in 1909, the government of Travancore actually decided to conserve the fort, you see they don't even mention the Dutch. It's just built by the Portuguese. This is Fort Emmanuel at Kochi, just the few remnants of Fort Emmanuel at Kochi, um, hardly anything also in terrible shape. This is the St. Francis Church in Kochi where you can still go. It's, this is actually quite well maintained. And this is the best maintained out of all the Dutch things. This is called Bolgati Palace. It is now a luxury hotel on Bolgati Island in Cochin, maintained by Kerala tourism. This was actually the Dutch uh, governor's palace here in Cochin. This is at Sadras. The fort at Sadras has had a restoration by the ASI so that you can see this. They have a Dutch cemetery there. So the only vestiges that you will find now definitely maintained are the cemeteries. This is the Dutch cemetery at Sadras. This is Pulikat, the very famous fort Keldria, total, almost totally gone, but you can still see its outline. What's remaining of it? It's cemetery. This is the gate to the cemetery. These are the Dutch graves in the cemetery at Pulikat. This is, of course, the Dutch Armenian cemetery at Surat. Surat also has a Dutch garden. I tried to get pictures of it, but I found so many pictures of European gardens being called Dutch garden at Surat. So I decided since I had not personally seen it, I would not put it in. This is the cemetery, the Dutch cemetery at Chinsura. And this is the old Dutch church in Hoogli. Um, unfortunately, its tower is gone, just the church is still remaining. This is from Patna. This is the facade. This is the record room that was there in the Dutch factory. Um, the Patna Collectorate Office has actually built up a huge complex around it. And they are in the process of breaking it down. Uh, thankfully, Intac and others went to the Supreme Court and they've managed to stop it at the moment. There is a Supreme Court stay and it hasn't been broken down. There are uh, other small Dutch buildings also within the complex, but they are in a very bad state and will probably be torn down quite soon. This is the only one that is sort of in a decent state. So moving on from that to food. The very famous Surti Nankhatais are supposed to be a remnant of the Dutch. And of course, there are many, many, many different stories about how it happened. The idea was that there was a bakery in the Dutch factory at Surat. And when the Dutch left it, they gave it to five Parsi bakers, out of whom one chap, Framji Pestanji Dotiwala, who still runs this bakery, uh, whose family still runs this bakery, apparently continued manufacturing the very famous bread that the Dutch were making there. And apparently, as the story goes, the leftover bread actually sold better because it was harder, drier, and apparently quite good if you were ailing. And from that, the Nan Khatai was born. Uh, my friend Kurush uh, Dalal, who's uh, you know a, a culinary anthropologist, says this is actually more remnant of a Dutch shortbread because this is a very nice shortbread biscuit. And I put this picture because you can actually order Dotiwala's Nan Khatai online all the way from Surat. Something else that you that is supposed to be uh, courtesy of the Dutch is the art of cheese making that the Dutch it Surat apparently taught the Parsis and the very famous Parsi Toplina Paneer are from supposedly that point of time. At in Kerala you have the Bruder, which is also a kind of yeasty bread cake which comes down from the time of the Dutch. Um, it looks like bread, but apparently tastes like cake. It has, it's flavored with nutmeg. There are apparently only two bakeries that still continue making this in uh, Cochin. Um, and they do very lovely ones at Christmas time, apparently with orange peel, etc. I have not tasted it. I'm taking somebody else's word for it. But Bruder also can be found in different forms in Malaysia and in Ceylon. So this is something that sort of continues across this um, East Indies area. So with that sweet bit of sweetness, I'm ending my story about the Dutch in India. I'm going to remember remember this when 
I eat my next installment of Topi <laughs> na Paneer. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the questions, Doc. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, how decisive was the ouster of the, uh, uh, of, was the battle of Kolachal with the Kerala Varmas? Oh, quite decisive. The departure of the, of the Dutch. Um, the D Dutch stayed away from Northern Kerala then. They still continued. Cochin, etc. stayed on. So it, that is going to be, of course, um, Travancore that is going to get rid of them afterwards. Right. So the, um, Travancore manages the Kolachal battle. Definitely the, Traven uh, they the natives won and the Dutch were on the back foot. But they were still quite keen on keeping an eye on the Portuguese who they felt would try and take over once they left. So they didn't leave, but their trade was finished. And so when the money's out at the end of the day, they can't survive. So they were removed from that. And of course, um, the British managed to get everything after the Q letters. They took all the Dutch factories in India. Being a Navy man, Commander wants to know, is there any reference to Dutch shipbuilding and cartography in India? I found it very difficult, let me be honest. One though, of course, I'm not in libraries because of the current situation, we have not been able to manage to visit libraries. Um, <clears throat> I did not find too much about Dutch shipbuilding, though they do mention um, wanting to make sh uh, repair yards. In India, I didn't find anything where they were actually building the ships. The ships definitely got built in um, the Netherlands only. But repairs were definitely carried out in the larger ports like Cochin. Uh, lots of compliments coming in, including from Dr. Ramana. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very, very much. Good. Completely spellbound, says somebody else. A question for Khaki, really. Can we have a repository of all these talks on our website? Good picks, nice presentation. You narrate very well. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let's go back to the questions. And um, Parag Gotse want to know, uh, he wants to know, when the ships to travel to Java and Jakarta, that is eastwards, where would be their stops or refueling points? They went straight from Bengal down straight to Ceylon. They would move down, but that's, see, that's the reason why. Okay, okay, let me, let me put it this way. Um, they can't possibly sail straight they have to stop which is why all these europeans needed to have points all along the way so you would stop at each port you would refuel in the sense you didn't need to refuel you didn't have fuel and you didn't have steamships but you did pick up on the other cargo so you gave your cargo you took other cargo that's how the whole exchange system worked over here <clears throat> And it kept going on until you got to Ceylon. And then from Ceylon, you had a little bit of a sail to go straight across to Java. Okay. You'd shown a picture of Batavia, Doc. So yeah. the, somebody wanted to know who was the artist. It, um, okay, sorry. I have it there on the, the picture itself. Would you like me to go back? Yes, or can please. we? Yeah, sure. Let me just uh, share. Or you can go back to it uh, afterwards. After, after the questions, yeah. And please remind me on it. I might forget, yeah. A similar question about the artwork on Masuli Pat Patnam. So Rajinder wants to know. Yeah, it's also over from. there. Um, if you do run Google searches on, uh, on these names, you will find, you have to hunt, but you will find. Most of it is freeware, um, but uh, some of it is not. But right now, the Ricks Museum has just opened up or digitized their their uh, collections um, and that is marvelous which is how we managed to get the Chinsura and Hoogli factory uh, paintings yeah um, Kaizad says he's seen a, a house in Cochin called Bastion House any connection to the Dutch I do not know Kaizad I'm sorry when I did go to Cochin you see I wasn't working on this paper so I hadn't really looked around for the Dutch so much but I shall look it up I shall look it up thank you for telling me uh, he Oh, yeah, he adds that it is supposed to be a Dutch property today. It houses government offices. May very well have been one of their buildings from the, because after all, it was the governor of the Malabar. So probably what could have been a building there. What was the emphasis of the Dutch on religion? Uh, was there no attempt at conversion to Christianity? I haven't found anything that talks about missionaries coming here at all. I haven't found anything that said that. So I, and everything points to them just being a company 
interested in making money through trade. So no, I have not found anything that talks about them being interested. The Portuguese definitely converted a lot of people, but none of the other three did actually. And there's and there are no churches. There are no. The church that we have are. is actually the the Portuguese church. Yeah, Saint yeah. Francis. Yeah. And let's move on and see for other questions. Uh, Trankabar is Danish, not Dutch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, we okay. still have time for about five more minutes. If anyone would like to ask any questions by unmuting themselves or keying them in into the chat box. We still have time for one or two more questions. Can I just show those pictures? Yes, please. Yeah. Here, it's by Andreas Beekman. Andreas Beekman. And uh, the Masuli Patnam one is here. This is from a book by Philip Baldes uh, called The True and Exact Description of the Most Celebrated East India Coasts of Malabar. So I you have, can find this sorry. one on both of them online. Yeah. I have one final question. Is it possible to visualize a scenario in which uh, the Dutch East India Company was stronger, more long-lived, uh, stood up to the East India British East India Company? What what would have been no, the scenario? No, the, uh, see, the Dutch didn't want. Let's put it this way: the British very cleverly realized that rather than just constantly sailing up and down and see they weren't really the dutch were not so bothered about india they wanted the spice islands whereas the british didn't bother once they'd been chucked out of uh, ambon which is the very Amboina. famous massacre of amboina um they really didn't bother with it and they they figured out after eight, uh, 1757 that if we want this our trade to work let's take the money from here so that's how that system worked whereas the dutch are still using the money that is being raised in the stock exchanges in in the Netherlands. I, I don't find them being at all interested in managing a large chunk of India. They're quite mm -hmm. happy having ports, factories. Their primary goal is exchange goods. They do not want to use their European silver. They would rather have goods that they will use to exchange um, other goods for. And that's, that's it. That's all it was. And uh, finally, they just, they had to hand over. I mean, it wasn't that they wanted to hand over. After four Anglo-Dutch wars, they actually had to hand over all their territories in England to the British, to the English East India Company. Akshay's question is that in the map of Bombay that you showed, there were different gates like Apollo Church yes, uh, yes, and Church yes. Gate. So does the church gate that we have today have roots to that? The answer yes, to of that course. Is yes, 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 of course. Great, Thomas. And we have one. Commander Narayan says there is a difference between the public sector and the private sector. <laughs> but well, Commander, the East India Company was also private also. sector. Uh, Adil says there's a book on BOC released at Baudaji Lad Museum a few years ago. Is that the same book by the OX uh, ambassador to the Netherlands? Because he's done a beautiful book, but I could not lay my hands on it. Um, he has done a very nice book where, from, the, from the time he was there. Ah, he's saying yes. Okay. Adil says yes. The VOC was government, um, Commander, the VOC was backed by the government, but it was definitely a private company. I know if you read a lot of them, they'll say the state owned it, but they, the state just gave it a complete and utter backing and allowed them to sign treaties and fight wars in their names. And the only thing they did was allowed them to use the Dutch Navy, but for which also they took the paisa. Adil, could you key in the name of the book? There's a question from I, Ankur. I did uh, have that somewhere. And Deepesh, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question as you want to. Deepesh Karmarkar. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. It was an excellent uh, talk. You're uh, most welcome. After you know, listening to you, what I, what I found uh, that uh, settlements like Vengurla, 
uh, you know, for example, uh, because Bengurla was the place which was not with the Portuguese earlier when Dutch took it over, and neither with British. So there was no presence of any other European no, at no. that place. But in many other places that you have shown, I think if I am right, uh, in most of it, you know, there there was a presence of Portuguese earlier, and then taken o- taken over by uh, British. Uh, I mean, sorry, Dutch. So, are there any such more places like Wengurla, you know, where they originally, you know, I mean, uh, they explored that place and you know decided to have their lodge, because uh, uh, there, because what I find is that because their approach of build, they, they they didn't have that empire building approach uh, when they came here, and I think their very narrow approach. And you know, a kind of a disinterest in rooting themselves in the in the region. Uh, so because I'm geographer, I'm putting it in this way that uh, that that's the reason why you know they could not be that successful. I mean, as compared to other, uh, so that that way, Wengurla I feel very important in a way that it was originally explored by them and set up. Uh, uh, so any any other such settlements. In Thank both you. Bengal and in the Coromandel, yes, the settlements were their own. They went there primarily just for trade. I I love what you said, rooting themselves there. Um, that's absolutely brilliantly put. Um, Vengurla is b- basically because they want to keep an eye on Goa, because they were quite convinced after they threw the Portuguese out of Ceylon that the Portuguese would use their points along the Malabar to come back. And that's the reason why they went and took their Portuguese forts. If you see on the eastern side in Bengal, it's not as much. Uh, Pipli and others are all the first spots where the Dutch are going to set up factories. But you must also remember that the reason why all these chaps are going to a certain place is because they get something there, whether it is cotton, whether it is silk, whether it is saltpeter, whether it is opium. There is something of value there, and that's why everybody is gravitating towards it, kind of like Surat. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Ma'am. You're most welcome. Okay. I think that brings us to the end of all our questions for the day, Doc. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for doing this for us. And audience, thank you very much for attending. Do keep on attending as many talks, as many walks as you can, and. Help us to keep talking and you keep walking. Thank you so much, everyone.